continue our uh, series, 21 Days of Change, and today we're going to uh, do something a little different. Today is our small group launch, and I've invited some people uh, that are awesome individuals that are doing community. they are some of our small group leaders here at Churches Across. I've asked them to come join me, if I can have you guys come on up. And we're going to talk about small groups and, and the importance of community and relationships. And so um, I'm going to have them join me. And uh, we got microphones for you guys. You just have to turn them on. All right. Well, why don't we start by, if, if I could start with you, Rick, introduce yourself and just tell them what small groups you are leading. And Okay. The first challenge is I have a different mic, and that throws me off right out but it's working. All right. <laughs> Last night I had to figure it out. Uh, I'm Rick Morange. Uh, we do a couple of groups. Uh, help facilitate a men's group on Monday mornings at 6.15 over at Pooch's. And then in the evening we have a huge men's group uh, with, along with Donnie and a bunch of other guys. Uh, and uh, we actually serve food to the guys and, and get into God's word and do studies. And then uh, my wife and I have done a couples group for about eight or nine years. And we're kind of shifting gears into more of a Bible study. Uh, kind of to honor what Stan and Jeff are doing with the couples here. And um, it, it's just been a blessing that I, I can't really properly convey it to you. If I really told you every story and everything that's happened throughout men's group and throughout our couples group, uh, I'd be up here all day. But I, I will tell you this. Uh, nine years ago, I was the guy who didn't want anything to do with joining. Most guys are that way. And I was the guy who really thought, you know what, I can do it on my own got the Bible, I've got God, I've got the Lord, and I'm going to be just fine. And nothing could be further from the truth. The truth is we need one another. God created us for relationship. In essence, uh, you know, in the beginning of time when God created the heavens and the earth, there was God the Father and the Son. You know, there was a relationship that existed in the very beginning. So he's wired us that way. Um, I've been blessed since then. I, as, as I say, I can tell you specific stories. I'll just tell you one, then we'll get it moving here. But um, Michael, many of you know Michael, passed a few months back. Uh, Michael was a guy that I really didn't know two years ago. And then little by little, we'd leave group and hang out by our cards and talk. And my wife would text me, hey, it's 10 o'clock. Where are you? And I thought group ended at 8, 830. You know, we just, this bond began. And, and I watched Michael go through cancer and the struggles of that. And at the same time, I, I listened to him talk about God's word and what that meant to him and what people like Stan meant and other brothers and uh, I watched him stand in front of people when he could hardly stand up I watched him give a 20 minute speech on one of his final nights with us and those are things you can't replace I mean you can't do that on your own you can't do that in, in some other fashion you have to be in, in the house of God with God's people so uh, I've been blessed Good morning. My name is Ann Burke, and I am the leader of the Sister Chicks. Um, we are a women's group. We've been here for uh, together for 13 years. Uh, people come, people go, but we're running strong, and we really embrace the, uh, our, the, the vision of our church was to love God, love others, and serve the world. We'll talk more about that later. My name is Courtney Cummings, um, and I've been here uh, six years now, uh, five on staff and two over the young adults. And so um, I oversee the leaders that have been leading our uh, young adult, one of our young adult Bible studies. But then now we're actually launching into two uh, young adult studies with different ages because we have outgrown our one. So which is really awesome. Um, and then I, six years ago when I came here, actually my first time at Church of the Cross was during a group launch Sunday. And I remember just being completely impressed by that because I was opposite to Rick. I wanted to be in a part of a group. I had just moved here. I had been out of college for a few months. And so for me, it was exciting to see that there were options to be a part of something. Excellent. Uh, and these guys are doing such a wonderful job uh, with their small groups. I mean, we're really experiencing community and relationship. And I just want to ask you guys, and just to open it up, why is it so important to find a small group and really get connected at, a, at the, our church. Go ahead, Ann. Okay, I'll start. Um, 
since I, I came to a small group, uh, to back to the Lord, I had drifted when I was 30, and I came back to the Lord through a small group up in New York and spent the next 25 years embracing the whole concept of small group and how that that's, was not only there for me, but for everybody else. So I, when I came here uh, and was looking, when I moved to Florida here 16 years ago, I was looking for a church that had small groups. That's how important I think it is. We need each other. We're wired to be so we, we're wired to be social. I mean, Jesus wants a relationship with us, and he gives us each other to have relationships so that we can be encouraged, supported. And um, I do not feel that uh, some people say, well, I read the Bible, and I talk, I pray, but there's more to it than that. There's a reason he created the body. And um, so I've always just felt that. Um, thankfully, uh, actually, my neighbor is here today. I saw him three weeks after I got here in the lobby, and he said, guess what? We have a small group in our house. So that was the beginning of my journey here at Church of the Cross, and um, my sister Chicks is my family, and I don't have any family down here besides my mother, so they are it. So I encourage you to join one. Oh, Sister Chicks sounds like a female motorcycle gang. I just have to say, man. It we got to get you guys some uh, leather jackets or something, man. Those that are sitting here now are going to know that I was not pro the name of that group, <laughs> being from New York. New Yorkers, Sister Chicks, too Southern for me. Um, but um, actually, it's, I've grown to love it. But boy, did I fight it when they wanted to do that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, Ricky, do you have something? Uh, I don't know about New York. Uh, I forgot the question. I just got oh, okay. Honest. The <laughs> important of being why connected. Are you tonight, the mic threw me off. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that uh, we we say here at Church of the Cross, and and it's not an original uh, statement. It's been around for a long time. You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And just so important that we have the right relationships in our life because it can take us to the next level or actually sink us. You know. And so I'm going to ask Courtney. Um, she. She said something uh, last night that I want to make sure she repeats this morning. Yeah, so um, I think that is really important to know that, you're, you know, your friends, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Um, when I was in third grade, I had just moved into a new neighborhood in St. Petersburg. And at the same time, a, um, another girl had moved in and um, into the neighborhood. And so we hit it off. You know, you're a third grader. You make friends. Um, and as I grew older with this young lady, um, I realized that even though we were like best friends, like this has become my best friend. Um, that we were completely different people. And she was a part of my church. She'd go to youth group with me. But as I grew closer to the Lord, it was like she never did grow close to the Lord. And I remember multiple times thinking in high school and even out of high school, man, if I, if I were to meet this friend without knowing her today, I don't think I'd be friends with her. But I had already had this connection with this person. You know, we were best friends since third grade. And, and, and it got to the point where after I moved out of Florida, um, the, the friendship, the relationship was, was not healthy. Um, and, you know, when I'd call upset about something, instead of getting wisdom or advice or, you know, just an ear, I would get, you know, an earful from her all mad and, oh, you should have told him off, you should have done this. And, and for three years, I, I just prayed and asked God, like, what do I do about this? Because, again, it's not just a friend that I, I you could grow apart from. She was my best friend. And I had to do one of the most difficult things I've ever done. And I, I realized that I, nothing I was saying was feeding into her life any longer. She had turned off everything I had said. And anything she was putting into my life was not beneficial to me. And I would see how it would affect me and, and my attitude and my walk with Christ. And so even after just a come to Jesus talk with her and her still denying um, I had to cut ties with that friend. And it's not anything I recommend, but, you know, on a regular basis. But it was, um, it was something I felt the Lord telling me to do, and I had to do it. And it was very difficult and very painful. Um, and so sometimes we do have to remove those, those toxic relationships, those friends. Um, and you love them, you pray for them, but that doesn't mean they need to be a part of your life. Now, likewise... It's important that you fill your life with people that can pour into you in a good way. Um, I really, I don't know at what point in my life I really understood this truth, but the Bible's clear about let the older men, you know, speak to the younger men. Let the older women speak to the younger women. 
And so looking back, as Stan and I were talking about this, every point in my life I remember um, seeking an older woman. That has always been important to me, to have an older woman that I can sit down with, share my, my feelings, my heart, um, talk to, and then them be honest and truthful with me. And so it's so important that not only um, you have, and I hope I'm not saying the word, but I love that you said this, you know, that you have somebody that is older pouring into you, that you have somebody that is accountable with you, and then hopefully at your walk in Christ that you are pouring into somebody as well. It should be kind of a cycle, and so that's important. You know, Proverbs 13, 20 says this. He said, walk with the wise, and you'll become wise. Then he says the opposite is true as well. He said, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And so it's really scriptural what, what uh, Courtney's saying. We need to choose our friends very carefully. We need to make sure that we have right relationships in our life. Rick, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, Jesus talks about what, what family really was. You know, when they questioned about his mother and his father and they, they're waiting for him to see you. No, my, my family is those that are following me family of Jesus Christ. So you really gain a family. When you get in a group, you become a part of a, a family that most of us, you know, with the brokenness in our world and the brokenness in virtually all of our lives at some point, right, the family, um, you can't replace that unless you get in with God's people because that's how God ordained it. That's how he wanted it to be. And when you embrace that and give it a chance, and I know I'm talking to a lot of guys out there that say, yeah, you know, I didn't explain it very well, but I gave it one chance. I said to my wife, I'm going to go once, and not to join, to get it over with. So no one will bug me anymore about this group thing, right? So I was that guy, you know? Mm. I was that arrogant guy, that guy that already had it figured out. But God will grab your heart when you trust him. And I took that step. My one-time shot and I'm done, guess what? They're doing the father wound. Mm. Do I have a father? No. Did I have one? Yes. Alcoholic father. I, I, just, I was all the wounds. And then on to the mother wounds and everything else. So God just kept pulling me back in, you know, and, and the amazing thing about these groups is we have a very special thing called confidentiality. We respect every person. So we'll take you wherever you are. You can be the talker. You can be the quiet person for five years that decides to talk one day. But we're going to protect your confidentiality. And what you share in a group really does stay in a group. Mm -hmm. When they first said it eight years ago, I didn't believe it. When I started leading, we, we made it a priority. And, and it really is true that you can share what's in your heart, that thing you, 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 know, you don't want to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. You can share that in a group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to transition to um, another question. The reality in our culture is, you know, we talk about relationship, but it doesn't come easy. And um, so I just want to open, open up to you guys. What are some of the barriers that you see that's preventing people from really experiencing really what we're talking about, community, family, relationship? So. No. <laughs> um, technology. <laughs> I'm going to talk about technology. I'm a, um, uh, a children's counselor, and what I have seen it do to our young generation uh, their relationships are on the internet. They, they text everything. They do not talk in person anymore. And it's scary. And I think that that's one of the biggest, um, from my standpoint, uh, barriers. The barrier I have as a sister chick leader is for, to get them to look at their Facebook. But we have all other issues than anybody else. Um, or to look at their email. Um, it is a, a um, skill that people need to learn on how to um, relate to others one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, we're even going to have a boundaries class um, this, this um, fall by um, Julie, which is going to say how to have proper boundaries, how to know when a person is safe, as you were talking about. So if that's thing that something that you would like, I would do that. But basically, uh, what I'm saying is, is that um, there are ways, and, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is the fact that we all have family living all over the country. Um, it was different back in the days where everybody lived on the same block. And so you, you, you need a family. You have something inside of you that is some missing. And what's missing is a family, and your small group here at Church of the Cross can serve that purpose. 
Yeah, I think um, another um, thing that makes it difficult is fear. I think for many people, it's just fear of, of stepping out. We have we have our schedules, we have our routines. You know, it could be busyness, um, but there's a little bit of that. What's it going to be like? Who's going to be? Am I walking into a big group or is it a small group? What if it's awkward? Are they going to make me talk? What if someone makes me pray? You know, um, and so you just have to know that. First off, like no matter where you go, you're going to be welcomed, and and you can be honest. So if you walk in, you're like, I'm I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to sit here and please do it. Come, you know, if if <laughs> if you feel uncomfortable, say it. It's okay. We want you. And so I think it's just stepping past that and and being bold. And and it starts by writing your name on a, a list. If you're interested, if something sounds interesting to you, write your name down. You know the the worst that it's going to happen is someone is going to call you and invite you to come. <laughs> um, and then to take that next step and just do it. Um, I've had moments in my life where I have been desperate for friends and relationships. And I got to the point after, you know, being a young adult, kind of getting to the mid-20s, mid where I finally would just walk up to people. And as awkward as it was, was I'd be like, can we be friends? Can we hang out? Is that cool? Mm. Like, I like you. You seem cool. You know, and so it's just stepping past that and being okay with that and knowing that most people are going to receive that and, and are going to welcome that as well. And I think it's very important, you, really what you're talking about is being very intentional. I read an interesting article last week and just talked about how modern conveniences has really affected how we relate to one another. And just a couple I'll just throw out there to you. They talked about air conditioning. Okay, I'm, I'm showing, given my age, I remember a time when we didn't have air conditioning. And so where did you go, go to get cool? You sat outside, you sat out in the front yard, this was in Cleveland, sat out in the front yard, neighbors were sitting out in front, so you related to them, you talked with them. And so um, the other thing they, uh, this article talked about was uh, attached garages. Years ago, and even today, you have older houses that have detached garage. Well, today, you have an attached garage, like a bat cave. You just pull your car in. You know, you open a door. You, you pull your car in, shut the door, and you go right into your house. Well, years ago, I still remember growing up in Cleveland, my, everybody, all the, uh, the fathers in, uh, in the uh, neighborhood all worked in factories. So they pretty much got off at the same time. <clears throat> so it was nothing um, to see my dad talking to the neighbor. They would arrive at the same time, have to get out and open the garage door, pull the car in, and they would just be chatting over the fence line. Well, those days are over, you know? And then you look at even the answering machine. It talked about how the answering machine changed the way we relate. There was actually a time, particularly those of you that are young, there used to actually be a time when if you wanted to find out who was on the other line, you had to pick up the phone. I know it's wild and crazy, bizarre thought, but but the answering machine came along, all of a sudden, you can isolate. You don't have to pick, oh, that's a salesperson, or that's Aunt Martha's asking for another handout. I'm not going to answer that. And so, anyway, that just changed our whole perspective. I'm not saying, I'm, I am pro-air conditioning, okay? I'm not against any of these conveniences. But we need to know how they affected us, and we need to know that we need to, to be intentional. And um, I just want to read this really try to read this very quickly and it talks about social media and the rise of social media and man we use social media here um, I mean it, there's good things so I'm not throwing social media under the bus but it talked about also the negativity and says it was stunning that social media is creating an epidemic of deferred loneliness and then it says, think about it. if you feel a little bit lonely, so you, you post something on Facebook or you upload a picture on Instagram or you tweet something, and then generally speaking, you get almost immediately, you get an instant feedback. And so they're just saying, okay, you post something, you get instant fee feedback, you feel good about yourself for a moment, but then you recognize, you recognize that that person scrolling, they're, they're probably already 50 more likes within the next couple minutes of other people they liked. You follow what I'm saying? So they're not sitting on the other line just saying, man, that's, man you look really good and, and, and really dialed in to what you put on there. Man, you're just one of many within the last couple minutes that, 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 the, that was liked. And so it just talked about it was very easy, just temporary. You're feeling good about yourself and just talked about the loneliness. And like Ann said earlier, it's very easy to come to the conclusion, man, there's something wrong with me. There's something, you know, what's broke in my life when actually 
What's missing is really community. Really what's missing is walking and doing life the way God created it, and that's doing life together. And so <clears throat> my question to you guys here is, what is that like, what does doing life together look like? But leading into that, I do want to say one thing. We're getting ready to go on a mission trip in a month, just to kind of maybe something like an aha moment I've had. I notice when you go on mission trips, particularly third world, the first half of the mission trip, first couple days, you're almost overwhelmed with the lack of modern conveniences. Oh man, they, they need running water, they need electricity, they need indoor plumbing. So the American, and at least myself, you want to be a hero, hey, I need to bring construction team down here, we need to bring these people up to, up to par here and, and all that, improve their living conditions. But at least for me, what I've noticed, about halfway into the mission trip, all of a sudden you become envious. All of a sudden, because of a lack of convenience, they are enjoying community. They don't have any competition. They're not sitting in their, in their houses, in their one-room houses, playing video games or iPods. I'm not throwing, again, I'm not coming against that, but they're, they're enjoying one another. And so all, all of a sudden you, you move from, I gotta be a hero to, man, what's lacking in my life? So anyway, just again, not throwing modern conveniences under the, the bus. We need just to be aware of how that affects us, how we need to be intentional about building relationships. We'll go back to the question. Sorry, I'm all over the place. How does, what does community look like to you? And Rick, we, we talked just before service. Yeah, I'll tell you, before I go into community, uh, I, I have the tech solution for you, okay? Here's the tech solution. Everyone needs a friend named Eli. If you have a friend named Eli Lofton, you'll do what we do. You'll text, and as my wife knows, you might get a response from me that week or that month. And then Eli and I, we used to have a 24-day rule. I think we've expanded that to like eight months. So you can text someone and know that, hey, you're going to see them. You're going to actually see them face-to-face. -face. You're going to be in their life, talking to their kids, talking to their spouses, and really being involved in what a real community looks like, not a not a phantom out there. I, I'm the tech guy that will slam it. I'll throw it under the bus. But anyway, point being, you can either live your life through what Stan was talking about and have those deficits that we all experience through technology, or you can seek out real people that you can look in the eye. You know, I, I think about the, the team of Daves. You know, I've, there's so many Daves. There's Dave Honan, Dave the Roofer, Dave Parrish, you know, and that's just one name. I could give you about 10 more. These are my go-to guys. These are the guys I go to. How did we end up at the church? Good question, I'm glad you asked. Years ago, my wife said, hey, what about the one with the big cross? I said, I don't think I've been to that one. I've been to all the other ones in Bradenton. She said, well, let's try that one. So we drive in this very parking lot over here, and a guy goes across the lot in front of us. He turns around, he waves, hey, man. And I'm oh, waving and smiling, and I said, you know that guy? <laughs> no. I said, I've never seen him in my life. You know who it was? It was another Dave. It was Dave Pavkovich. Imagine that. <laughs> there you go. And, you know, so Dave Pavkovich right away emits the love of Jesus Christ. And it welcomes you into our church. That's what the groups do. You know, and then through that, you know, the same stubborn guy I talked about before asked Stan, well, why should I join your church? And Stan very patiently and kindly and graciously, as he always is, outlines that for me in our, in our membership group, you know, in our class. And, and suddenly God opens my eyes and starts peeling those layers away and getting me to absorb his word. And that's what our groups do. We all come back to God's word as the ultimate authority. We're not counting on how Rick feels. We don't want that. We're not even counting on how Stan feels. We all have good and bad days. But we are counting on God's word as the ultimate authority. Sorry, real quick. So to speak for my young adults and, and millennials, we use texting properly. And so we respond to each other. Uh, and so actually how we do life, a little bit different than Rick here, uh, is we have an app that we use and we have a group messaging. And um, what happens is uh, conversation is constantly happening. I think I have some in, some in the group that have muted it and check in it here and there. And then some that are like always posting. Like, I, I'm not even kidding. Like, I probably shouldn't say this, but there's times in here where we're like, hey, hey, talking, to, you know, but we're in, the, in church together. And, um, but because of that, spontaneity happens and, and life happens. And so just this past uh, yesterday, 
um, we had two conferences in our area that were being posted about. Hey, anybody want to go with me to this? Hey, you want to go to that? And that happens, and people get involved. We have food, you know. Hey, we're going out to eat. And so that's one way, you know, we use that. But then the other way, and I'm not slamming you. Um, and then the other way is, like, we... Um, we just, what you find out is that people love food, love to be together. And so as I find those certain people, those gatherers, um, you know, you, you ignite that. And then all of a sudden it's like people are like, hey, where, what are we going to do? They're looking to me. I'm like, I don't know. Lead it up. Where do you want to go eat? Let's go. You know, and so suddenly life is happening because you fuel that fire and um, we have it. We, we have so many young adults in the church and, and you'll see handfuls, but then there are more and more. And right now in our um, group me app, I think we have 33, 33 people that are communicating and creating group and life. So, um, Somewhere in between these two. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, uh, just, uh, just to give you a general idea what most of our groups tend to do here is we learn from the word of God so that we grow to be the person that God wants us to be. We learn how to have healthy friendships mm -hmm. um, by the people that we meet in the groups. We learn who's safe, we learn who's not. We have a lot of fun going out, going to the beach. We've even gone on a cruise, my group. Um, and then most importantly, we're being equipped by God to serve others. And our group, uh, for instance, a lot of the groups are involved in projects, service projects. We're making plastic um, bed mats for the homeless. We've been doing this now for about nine months. And it gives us a chance to get together and have fun and yet do something that's serving our community in a very mighty way. Because the whole point is, is to serve others and to bring others to the Lord. So, um, it's so much easier for two, three, four, five, six to do that work of God together. You get the support and you have that encouragement that you so need. So um, basically that's sort of how our groups are, are and uh, I, what I'll, they do. I'd just like to say like with Ann's group and, and all, all our groups is really good about this, but uh, with Ann, I can't beat her to a crisis. And what I mean by that, um, when I find out somebody's in a hospital or whatever, my first phone call is to their small group leaders just to make them aware of it. And every single time I've ever called Ann to, uh, to, I think I'm informing her about somebody that's in a hospital with her group, she tells me, well, they've been in a hospital for three days and we've already been up there twice in a, today or we've already had meals lined up. Every single time they're there for that person. And it's just a, a beautiful example, really doing life together. And I'll just wrap up with this. I know in my own personal life, for those of you who um, may not know, I've been, on, I've been uh, on staff here since 84. My wife and I have been attending here since 76. A lot of times I have people ask me, like, I know, man, I'm really giving my age away, right? But um, a lot of times people ask me, well, how have you been a pastor for so long at the same church? And I've actually pondered that, and it's through relationships. Bottom line, it's relationships and it's really doing life together. And there's a, there's a group of pastors that I meet with. Um, we, we call it a covenant group. There's three of us that meet together. We try to meet together weekly and just pray for one another. We're accountable to one another. Uh, I'm part of the men's group here. Um, I, I look at Jeff Archer, Dave Parrish. Um, as they're, they are part of our elder board. The elder board is, uh, is, a, is a small group and support to me. Those guys actually saved my life. For those of you who may not... No, uh, six years ago, um, I battled uh, throat cancer. My wife battled breast cancer. And, and what happened is, before I was diagnosed with throat cancer, um, I'm just being very honest with you. You guys know, some, those of you that have been here with me, you, you know what happened. About 15 years ago, um, I was very driven and uh, to a point of burnout. So I went to uh, my mentor, and he said, man, you need to get into a Christian counselor because I was having a panic attack. Christian counselor really helped peel back the layers in my life, helped me see what was going on. So work through that. Uh, but I have a, one of my shortcomings is I can become a very driven person. And so six years ago, Jeff and Dave Parrish came to me and said, hey, man, we need to meet with you. And he said, hey, you know, we love you and we're concerned about you. We see you burning the candle at both ends. And we'd love for you to go back to your counselor, Robbie Goss, and sit down with him and just get a checkup. 
And I, and I told him, I kind of pushed back and said, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with you guys. I said, my wife is getting over breast cancer. And I said, I'm just stressed out because of that. And I'm tired because of that. And he said, man, we just need you to do this. I said, I love you guys. I know you guys got my back. And um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm um, submitted to the elder board. I said, I'll do that. So I, I left that meeting and I called my counselor. He got me in like two days later. We got in, and before we even started getting into the session, he said, what's going on with your voice? I said, oh, man, I've been having some acid reflux, been going to the doctor for about a year, can't really kind of clear it up. He said, that could be something very serious. You need to go to, you need to, go to a throat uh, specialist. So we went through the session where he kicked my butt pretty good, and, and I'm getting ready to walk out the door. He said, action steps, Dan, you need to go to a throat doctor. And so I left there. And the next morning, I called and got into a throat doctor. Another, it was another day or two. Got into a throat doctor. Throat doctor looked at my throat, scoped it, and said, "Man, you got a tumor the size of a plum. It looks it's probably cancer. I need to get in there and get that out immediately because it's it's blocking your air passages and all that." And so I'm talking about. I was in his office at three o'clock in the afternoon. I was being operated on seven a.m. the next morning. I say that to tell you this, community saved my life, okay? Community is being there for one another. Those guys love me enough to say, hey, Stan, man, there's something off with you. You need to get this checked out. And, and Robbie, you know, just uh, my counselor just saying, hey, you need to get this checked out. So I just want to tell you, we need community. It saved my life. And I want to encourage you guys, as, as Courtney said earlier, to be very intentional and step out. And, um, and as Ann said, man, we have Bible studies, we have a, a great time, camaraderie, and we have a lot of fun as well. So it's not all serious, but it, it's a combination of both. And we've got small group tables that are set up um, down the hallway, and I just want to encourage you, we've got some great groups coming up. And I want to just highlight three groups um, that we're going to start. Rick had helped lead one of the men's group, and so I'm going to show you a clip a trailer of a new series that's and going to be coming on board. Well, Stan, I'm going to do British Parliament style here. You know, I hope you guys love that. Everybody just starts jumping in. Uh, i got to tell you real quick, because I never answered the community part. Mm -hmm. Community is your wife has surgery, and people bring you food. So much food every night for a week, you can't eat it. You're trying to give it away. Community is your mother passes away, and it's the night of a men's group, and you go, and while people are filing through, at the, at the uh, service, the memorial. Not five, not 10, maybe 15, 20 guys march through and walk by. That's community. You can't make that up. 